In the summer of 2003, I found myself in an uncomfortable circumstance. It was 2 a.m., pitch black, and I was lost without GPS on a dirt road deep in the center of the Navajo Reservation. My anxiety of being lost in the dark desert night was heightened by the fact that I, while I'd been road tripping, I was listening to Tony Hillerman mystery novels about murders and witchcraft and potential supernatural happenings in the very landscape I then struggled to navigate. Hillerman's books had an intense and engrossing sense of place like few others, the effect of which I was then regretting. With this scene in mind, I welcome you to Riding Westward. I'm your host, Brennan Rensink. And looking back, I can now chuckle at my desert nighttime Hillerman enhanced anxiety. It's also with great excitement, therefore, that I read through James McGrath Morris's new, simply titled biography, Tony Hillerman, A Life, published by the University of Oklahoma Press in 2021. I truly hope you enjoy our conversation as much as I did. For new listeners, allow me to take a moment to explain a bit about writing Westward and myself. Each episode features a conversation with people writing about the North American West. Historians, journalists, novelists, poets, scientists, sociologists, and others. By showcasing their work, I hope to spark your curiosity to think more deeply about the region, its lands and environments, and the histories and experiences of the peoples who call it home. If a writer or topic intrigues you, you can find links to their work in the show notes or at writingwestward.org. And if you have a moment, please do subscribe, share links with friends, leave us a review or rating on Apple Podcasts or whatever platform you're using to listen, follow us on Facebook and Twitter, and send in some feedback. Writing Westward is supported by the Charles Red Center for Western Studies at Brigham Young University, where I, Brennan Rensink, serve as Associate Director and an Associate Professor of History. For better or worse, this is a one-man operation with me playing role of host, producer, sound engineer, publicist, and everything else, all tasks for which I have no training. But I am passionate about the North American West, so this difficult work is well worth the excuse to read more books and talk to interesting people. At the end of each episode, I'll include a little bit more information about me and my scholarship and about the Red Center, our public programming and projects and funding opportunities that you could apply for. With that, let me introduce a little bit more about today's guest and why we're talking to them. James McGrath Morris is a biographer and writer of narrative nonfiction. His biographies have been more than well-received, boasting a New York Times bestseller, winner of the Benjamin Hooks National Book Prize, and titles of the Wall Street Journal and Washington Post and others listed among the best books and biographies of their years. Today we talk about his most recent biography, Tony Hillerman, A Life, published by the University of Oklahoma Press in 2021. Raised in Oklahoma during the Great Depression, Hillerman was a journalist turned novelist who is perhaps best known for his best-selling detective mystery novels set in the American Southwest, with indigenous protagonists and backdrops. The 18 novels set mostly among the Navajos, featuring tribal police officers Joe Leaphorn, Jim Chi, or both, have been praised for their intimate and in-depth explorations of Navajo culture, religion, and geographies. Morris unfolds Hillerman's life in a way that reveals how his upbringing among Potawatomis in Oklahoma and the traumas suffered in World War II led him to these Navajo topics, finding in their world and traditions a path towards the inner harmony that he sought and needed. Though not without detractors, especially toward the later stages of his career when public discourse over cultural appropriation grew, these Southwestern novels were not only national and international bestsellers, but widely read among Navajos and other natives in the Southwest. Few authors so consistently placed readers in Western landscapes in such convincing fashion as Hillerman. Morris's treatment of Hillerman the man and his literary works is thoughtful and engaging. Those already familiar with Hillerman's work will find this biography fascinating. And those unfamiliar will find themselves rushing to purchase some of the Joe Leaphorn and Jim Chi novels to see if they're really as good as Morris makes them sound. Spoiler alert, most of them are. James McGrath Morris, welcome to Writing Westward. Glad to be with you. I'm really uh, happy that you could join us and really excited uh, about this biography of Tony Hillerman and congratulations on, on getting it out there. Thank you very much. Why don't you tell us about how you first came across Hillerman's work and what drew you in? 
Well, the first book of Hillerman I ever read was in 1979. I was working as a reporter in Jefferson City, Missouri. And my boss handed me a book, and it was a fly on the wall, Hillerman's second novel, not a Navajo novel. And he said, you ought to read this as a reporter, and it's a fascinating book for reporters. It's all about reporting in a state capital. Previously, I'd worked in Albuquerque and had met Tony Hillerman. He was then a spokesperson for the university and not well known yet. And um, so I wrote him a fan letter from Jefferson City and addressed it Tony Hillman University of New Mexico, Albuquerque, New Mexico, and uh, told him how much I loved the novel and was the cover, was the capital described in the book, the one in Jefferson City. Because again, this is pre Google, I couldn't look up anything. Right? So I get this very nice type letter back from him. Um, which is, uh, I, I was amazed. It turns out he didn't have that many fans at that point. So right, answering fan mail was still possible, something he had to give up eventually. And he said, no, the Capitol was actually based on Oklahoma City, where he had worked as a Capitol correspondent. And then he asked me if I'd seen the spot of the mistake in the book. And, I, and what he'd done is he took his piece of paper and put it back in the typewriter upside down so that the answer would appear like a PS at the bottom of the page, but upside down so you couldn't read it right away. So I turned the piece of paper over and it said that the protagonist at one point when he was being chased by bad guys through the Capitol took off his shoes, his leather shoes, so as to not make sound. Well, I never put them back on. So he goes outside in the sleet and the mud and the governor's mansion in sock, in slipper, I mean, uh, socks and no shoes. So I thought this was a pretty special moment. He's confessing a, an error to another aspiring writer. Well, when I started doing this book three or four years ago, I discovered that was his favorite error. He used to tell people that all the time. So now when I do public appearances and I tell that story, I uh, tell them, if you check page 222 of my book, you'll find I misplaced a major university into the wrong state. So we all make errors and we all live <laughs> off of them. But that's how I first heard of Hillerman's work. And then my wife and I became addicted to his Navajo novels and read them as they came out over the next 20, 30 years. What's your personal relationship with um, with the Southwest and kind of this the broader region that Hillerman's Navajo novels are set in? My relationship turns out to be not dissimilar from Tony's. Uh, I, I'm an Anglo immigrant to New Mexico. I came here first in 1977 and worked as a radio reporter in Albuquerque. Because of New Mexico's economy, the better jobs weren't here. And, and when I had some success as a reporter, I was lured to Missouri, um, lure, lured, like Boy, my, my, I'm not lords, lured to <laughs> New Mexico, oh, to Missouri, and then eventually to Washington and some places in upstate New York. Um, but we returned to New Mexico about 20 years ago, my wife and I. And um, we're very conscious of, of this is an extraordinary multicultural state, but we are Anglos, we are immigrants. And I shared that with, with Hillerman in the same sense, same sense as being, you know, there's no other way to describe it, madly in love with the state with an enormous passion to explore every corner of it, to write about every corner of it, which is what drove Hillerman to do the same. Yeah, it is a captivating region. And I mean, we can we can go back, you know, we saw this early early 20th century fascination, right, with uh, lots of artists and poets and people that, you know, set up shop in Santa Fe or Taos uh, or other places around the Four Corners. It does have a mystique mm -hmm. and um, a kind of indescribable draw that yourself, Hillerman, lots of other outsiders who didn't grow up in the Southwest uh, visit and end up relocating, you know, just enamored with the with the region. And the outsider concept is very important in writing. Um, it, it's one of the reasons why, even though people attack the press for misrepresenting things, a reporter parachuting into some place, into Moscow to write a story or Afghanistan, asks questions that people who've grown up with assumptions don't. And, uh, and so writers who fall in love with New Mexico or Utah or other places tend to have a, a, a fresh look when they inquire. And that's why I think these states are celebrated and they're writing in a different way by outsiders. Of course, the biggest of them all, the model, that is de Tocqueville. I mean, de Tocqueville knew very little about the United States. And when he wrote his, his two volumes in Democracy in America, he made observations that we, as native-born Americans, two centuries later, almost two centuries later, take as being obvious. Yeah, that's an interesting example, yeah. Well, I really, 
I didn't know much about Hillerman's backstory. Mm -hmm. I think I've read most of the Navajo novels. I ran into them uh, as a grad student, and I had a, a very strange job that required me to drive around the Four Corners region, like every back highway, dirt road in, you know, northern Arizona, New Mexico, wow. Durango area. I've driven it. And um, I had read one of his books, I think in grad school, I think it was assigned in grad school, mm -hmm. uh, like Skinwalkers, I think, had been assigned to me. I'm like, oh, that's really interesting. My wife was from Arizona. I wasn't. But then I uh, got another one as a book on tape for this long road trip uh, job that I had. And I start noticing place names on signs. I'm like, wait a second. I think that was a few chapters ago. I just heard about that, right? Yeah. Yeah. And uh, immediately uh, I just went, we started going to the library and checking out every single one of them as books on tape and would listen to them as I drove. It was, it, it was really great. But as an outsider myself, you know, I didn't have a lot of familiarity with the region. And so uh, Hillerman's, his aesthetic and the tone and the way that he wrote about the region really colored my early impressions. Um, I don't know if it's for better or the worse. Um, it, you know, makes you kind of think that there's murders and plots and conspiracies around every corner, which is, you know, not the case. But um, but, he, but his writing was very much part of what kind of drew me and grabbed me uh, about the Southwest as a region. Yeah. Well, murders aren't everywhere around each corner because if you think about it, there are 18 novels set over a 30-year period. That's a pretty low murder rate. It's not the Cabbage Cove phenomena where everybody in the town ends up on the morgue. Yeah, and the murder she wrote, right? Yeah. Yeah, the highest per capita murder rate in, in the world. I would yeah. Think. <laughs> well, why don't you tell us a little bit about um, Hillerman's first uh, experience in the Southwest and specifically... Uh, with Navajos, mm -hmm. uh, he had related this multiple times as kind of the maybe the key turning point in his life, and you relate it quite beautifully. Um, and to kind of set it up for listeners, this is post World War II. Hillerman is fresh home from Europe, mm -hmm. um, having been injured, probably suffering. He says later he realizes probably suffering from PTSD, although mm -hmm. they didn't have a word for it. And he's out on a random job in the middle of nowhere in New Mexico, and he runs across a scene of Navajo veterans who also had just returned, but from the Pacific. Um, tell us what, what he experiences. Well, the story is so remarkable that um, I had to adapt. I had to uh, sort of think about it a lot over the last three years, because as a trained reporter, my first editor told me famously, most first editors tell their, their reporters this, if your mother says she loves you, check it out. So it was one of two Hillerman stories that seemed too good, um, mm. but it, in fact, it, it is more evidence to support it. So I, I, I believe it. When he came back from the war, he was wounded, as you described. He couldn't. He still had a patch on one eye occasionally because his vision was so poor, and uh, he'd almost gone blind. He'd stepped on a shoe mine. These German destructive mines that are made mostly of wood, so they couldn't be picked up by metal detectors, and he was almost killed. And his left leg was badly damaged and he got a job driving oil rig equipment out to the Navajo nation um, uh, to a white rancher out there and uh, they they drove old 66 and they took a right uh, going north to Crown Point which is where they're going to deliver things and as Hillerman drove he saw Navajos dressed in regalia on horses crossing the road for an Oklahoma kid who'd been raised with Potawatomi Indians, just seeing a Native American wasn't a surprise, but the way they were dressed caught his attention and what they were carrying with them caught his attention. So he asked the rancher what they might be doing, and he said they were probably going to do an enemy way, which is a curing ceremony Navajos use for returning veterans from the war in a way to you know cleanse them of all the evil that they've been immersed in during the war. So he asked if he thought he could go and see some of it. And the rancher said, well, probably if you're not drunk and you're polite, they'll let you spy, in, you know, sit in. And on it. So that night he went and watched. And the ceremony, like most Navajo ceremonies, are very powerful to experience. Um, the use of drums, the dancing, the chanting, it, 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 it's hard to escape it without strong memories. I was privileged to go to a blessing way ceremony, and I still remember every aspect about it. And it really struck uh, Hillerman. Um, what particularly caught his attention is that they focused on restoring harmony. This is the big deal for Navajos. It's uh, 
uh, I've never found another way to put it because it's not like Buddhism and it's not like Quakerism because it, it sort of diminishes it to compare it to that. But they have this drive for for finding harmony with the world, herso as they call it. And this this ceremony was to do that. And it's the first time Hilleman really confronted this idea that his harmony was disturbed. And so I believe that it's not an accident that in 1952, when he moved to New Mexico and began to have more encounters with Navajos, that he was drawn to it. And I think it also explains, which we can talk about later, a kind of a, a emotional obsession with the uh, Navajo pursuit of harmony that is in every one of his books uh, and forms a, a constant narrative thread from Blessing Way all the way to the last book. Yeah. T t tell us more about how this realization impacted Hillerman. I mean, so this is uh, right after the war. He then works mm -hmm. in Oklahoma and Texas before coming Back yeah, to well, New Mexico, he, right? Yes, he's one of the millions of Americans that was changed by uh, one of the most extraordinary th things our country ever did, which is the GI Bill. And younger people don't remember the impact it had, but millions and millions of kids who would have never gone to college not only got to go to college, but they were well supported, I mean, fully funded to go. So Tony went to the University of Oklahoma's journalism program and left from there and got a job as a reporter, graduated, got a job as a reporter reporter in Borger, Texas, then in Lawton, Oklahoma, and then finally in the state capitol working for UP United Press, which is, they had a their bureau in Santa Fe, bureau meaning one reporter and one boss, uh, needed a new bureau chief. So he jumped at the chance of going to Santa Fe. He wanted to work in the state capitol like, like the one he'd been raised in. But, um, but he was taken by Oklahoma, by New Mexico. He'd been out here in 1949 with Marie, his young bride, who was pregnant with uh, Ann Hilleman, who still writes these books today. And he knew uh, um, New Mexico was in his trajectory. I don't think he knew the extraordinary effect it would have on him when he got here, but that's how he ended up here in New Mexico. So he always remained in Oklahoma, uh, and he's beloved in Oklahoma and went back all the time, but he became a New Mexican too. I th this kind of insider-outsider dynamic, uh, I think is really interesting. And it's something that I had on my mind. It's something that I've had on my mind from the moment I discovered the Hillerman himself was not Navajo, um, yeah, which I didn't, I don't, I don't think I knew people, initially. You know. uh, but also, you know, he's an outsider also just not being from I mean, I guess he was a West, definitely a Westerner, mm -hmm. um, but not from the region. But he, his childhood in Oklahoma was not typical for an Anglo. Mm -hmm. He grew up, uh, his, his father ran a, a store. He attended school, a uh, Catholic uh, school with native children, with Potawatomis mm -hmm. mostly, yeah. I believe. So he had grown up around native peoples. Oh, his his origin story is 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 unique uh, and, and very different. You can't just use a broad brush to say he was raised in Oklahoma during the Depression, you know that kind of thing, because he grew up in a town that was remarkable. It's called Sacred Heart, and there were probably thirty two people living there then, and now there's twenty two. Um, but this little town and this name is a clue to it because it come, comes from the French Sacré Cœur, was the center of Catholicism in Oklahoma. I mean, it wasn't, I say that as steel is to Pittsburgh, Catholicism was to Sacred Heart. They had this massive monastery that the French had built in the 19th century that dispatched monks all around the state that opened up the parishes. Uh, the monastery did burn down, but it remained an intensely Catholic town in that the two or three Protestants were given a plot in the cemetery off to the corner because it was easier to maintain than to have them have their own cemetery, but there was nothing but Catholics in the town. He didn't just get taught by Catholic nuns. He was taught by Sisters of Mercy, a very particular order. And these nuns had a fourth vow that was to be of service. So, you know, chastity and the normal, uh, what is it, poverty, vow power, poverty, that kind of thing. They added the vow of service. And this becomes important because Hilleman was taken by it, as was Marie Unzner, a young girl growing up in Shawnee to the north who would eventually marry Tony Hilleman, was also being taught by Sisters of Mercy. So they both had a, a very vigorous Catholic life, a, a spiritual life that they brought with them to New Mexico. And it influenced their philanthropy later and influenced a lot of their worldview. But it was also um, 
and I'm not trying to offend Catholics, but it was a very enlightened, open view of Catholicism in the sense that he he didn't think that it was wrong that the Navajos had a different spiritual tradition, and he thought there was room for them uh, and within the uh, for him to be a Catholic and understand their world, which you know a lot of a lot of religions have the same thing, depending on the fundamental. Uh, fundamentalists within the religious order or the, the the different groups. So, but, but Catholicism that he gained as a child and his exposure to Potawatomi girls, because he went to the, the school for girls, because that was the one that was academic. The one for boys was a trade school. Really changed things because he grew up with the idea that Native Americans were, you know, any seven-year-old kid who's playing with Native Americans would think this is part of the normal order of things. And he has very funny stories. I mean, Hillerman is, is at times comic um, about how his friends who boys who are Potawatomi wanted to be the cowboys in, in the cowboy and Indian games they would take because they'd been to the movies and saw the cowboys always won. So he had a humorous uh, recollection of those years, but that made him very open. And that, that thing of being other, um, the other thing that happened to him, Hillerman Young is he went to high school in Kanawa, which is the big town nearby, the, the equivalent of the big city. And that's when he discovered that the world was divided into city kids and rural kids. At least that was his view. And that was a fundamental division that existed throughout his life. So when he encountered Navajos at trading posts, and they were very puzzled by this and some took offense to it, he looked at the commonalities between himself as an Anglo and they as Navajos. And he would say to them that, you know, you're just like me, you're country folk. You sit on the porch like my dad did and tell stories. And I interviewed some Navajos who were really offended by that because they didn't understand what Hilleman was saying. What he was trying to say is that we have, I see the thing in common between us rather than the thing in different, that is different about us. And his choice of an example was misunderstood by some. Many didn't, many got it. Um, and that's in a way how he bridged the you know, other aspect of being an Anglo wandering around the Navajo nation in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, and 90s, and two. 2008. Yeah, but it, it seems that this sensitivity that he had or familiarity he had with Native peoples um, uh, allowed him to, uh, to to be in the good graces of, of a lot of these communities as he was writing the books. And I mean, he, he talks, I mean, you talk in the book about how he would hear of in the most far-flung, remote little trading post somewhere in the Navajo Reservation, you know, the bookshelves were littered with his paperbacks, mm -hmm. they were. and so uh, they were they were devouring it. And so th there must be some that there was a a, a deep connection that he made, um, and maybe it's hard to put in words, but it obviously resonated. No, there there was, and the, one of the ways I explain it, and of course, we're we're about to stumble into the the difficult question of cultural appropriation here, but. The way the way I, I try to explain to people is that go back to the 1970s, and if a writer of any sort, a journalist, came to the Navajo Nation, their interest was in corruption, alcoholism, obesity, nuclear tailings, coal mining, pollution, all negative things. And here was this unassuming, humorous, friendly, jovial fellow who came out and he wanted to ask respectful questions about their traditions, their spirituality, their nation, and put it into print in a respectful manner in which they could see themselves. And there's a young woman who is, she's no longer young, but in the 1970s was growing up in Ganado, which is in the center of the nation. She came bursting out of her bedroom one night with a book in her hand and said to her seven sisters, Look, folks, our parents' gas station is in this book. And that little incident for me is kind of a metaphor about what Hellerman did for the Navajo Nation then. And it still endures. I taught for a day in the Chinle Elementary School, and one of the fifth graders was so proud to tell me that his grandmother in her hogan had a shelf set aside just for Hellerman books and how excited she was that I was bringing his life to print. Um, so that, that occurred in, the, in a very different world. In the 40 years since, um, we've now raised an enormous understanding of, of cultural appropriation, and Hillerman ran right into the buzzsaw of that. So it's a very mixed reception today. 
On one side, the Navajo Nation respects him so much that the new television series was filmed on the Navajo Nation. Um, so that obviously shows that in an official sense, they still respect his work. A lot of young, I, I don't know if I should say a lot, because I don't know what the number is, but the young Navajos I've encountered, it hasn't been unusual for me to hear that he had no right to do this. And when I ask what is it he did, they had to say, well, we, we don't read his books. Um, so they don't know what contains. And you contrast that with endless examples that I could find of kids who became readers because often their Anglo teacher in a BIA school handed them a Hillerman book. And not only was it a compelling tale, but their culture was featured in it. And James uh, Pleschlikai, a um, who late, late, uh, he died a number of years ago, a, um, a medicine man, claims, and I think it's an over, overstatement, but it does show how strong some people feel about it, that Hillman's work helped restore spirituality in the Navajo Nation because younger kids who had not been told these stories went home after reading a book and said to their elders, tell us about this sort of stuff. I think that's I think it's an over-exaggeration of Hillman's power, but I think it does represent what it meant to a number of Navajos. And also, you know, the world at large. I mean, think about it. In 17 different countries, these books were published, some 20 million copies. That meant the French, the Italians, the South Koreans, the Japanese, all got a very respectful glance at one of the most fascinating cultures in the world and came to understand it in a way that had they read an academic tome, they might not have. And um, it's so common on the Navajo Nation. I, I have done road scholar tours where I'm a group leader, where a third of the bus came to New Mexico in the Navajo Nation because they'd read a Hellman book. And of course, it spawns absolutely silly stories because, you know, they get pulled over for speeding in the Navajo Nation and they start joking about Jim Chi. So <laughs> the, the tribal police get a little tired of it. But other Navajos, particularly those who deal with the outside world, re recognize the powerful force for good that Hillman did with these books. And how do you think then that, you know, not just for foreigners, but for non-Native peoples in the United States, how did Hillerman's treatment of Navajo culture and religion and the landscape do something different than say, you know, I mean, there's, we could come up with a huge list of incredibly prolific Western novelists who wrote about native peoples and who were translated into countless languages and uh, spurred tourism to the region. What was different about how Hillerman touched outsiders and, and, and the impressions he left with them about native peoples, in, in contrast to maybe other Western authors? That's a hard question to answer, in part because I'm not an expert on all the Western authors. So, I, you know, it, it's hard for me to compare him in that what I did compare him within, which is in, within the genre of mystery writing, which a lot of Western writing is mystery writing too. I don't, except for the scholarly or novelists like Frank Waters or somebody like that. Um, what he did was, was really a revolutionary thing because in 1970, we're talking about 52 years ago, if you went into a bookstore in New York or DC or here and or in Arizona or Utah someplace, and you went to the mystery shelf, you were chased, faced with basically two forms of protagonists, the hard, hard boiled white uh, private eye in LA, or a, a cozy little woman in England who drank tea and seemed to solve a weekly murder in her town. The idea of introducing detectives of color, uh, Navajo detectives, um, was a startlingly new thing. And that opened up the floodgate, for better or for worse, in many cases for worse, because in the years since, a lot of imitators have come along and have never done the kind of uh, research that Hillerman did to do his books. Um, but that changed things in that, that it also, uh, his, instead of doing expository writing, he created a, a, a print play in which two main characters eventually, Jim Chi and Joe Leaporn, acted out an explanation of the Navajo world. You mentioned landscape. Many writers use landscape as a background, fill a paragraph about the clouds. Instead, you realize the landscape is actually a character in the books. And so when Joe Leaporn sits on a log and describes the Lukachukai Mountains and the, the clouds, and whether they're forming and whether you can get home before the storm and all that kind of thing, 
It's an important component, and the Navajo's church is the outdoor world. Um, the, the, there, there, there are four mountains that box them in, and all of that. And and you, can, I, I dare you to find a kind of typical thing that I would do as an externalist. That sort of expository paragraph where, in the th- sort of godlike third person, we explain something. In Hillerman's books, it's always the characters. So when Jim Chi approaches a hogan in which somebody has died. You can learn through Jim Chi why that's a problem and what what's going on, um, and that I think makes him somewhat different. Um, and Hilleman also um, was taken by the romance of the Southwest, but not like those painters in Taos at the beginning of the century that you know had heroic visions of the Navajos because he felt they were very much like us. I mean, meaning the us being Anglo's in this case, um, that they had this commonality. So. Um, uh, it's a it's sort of much more down to earth. In fact, one of the things I, th- I think it's interesting you you've listened to the audio books, which I have too. There are marvelous spoken word stories. They're much like a sophisticated tale on the porch. Um, so I think those are some of the things that mark them as being different. Yeah, they. I haven't thought about that, but I've listened to other audio books, you know, out running or on road trips that are a great story, but don't necessarily lend themselves well to the spoken Mm -hmm. word, but his did very much. So, um, it, and I I don't know, I guess in grad school, I did read that one as a print book, but, uh, I wonder if like, maybe they're even better, uh, being listened to as opposed to read. Um, there is a real kind of poetic nature of how he, especially how he describes the scenes. And that's really what drew me in, right. Was his descriptions, as you say, of the landscape and the mountains and, um, I mean, I had, I found it very interesting. You note that uh, one of the early reviews of, I think it was maybe his second book, um, Dance Hall of the Dead, which mm-hmm. was actually set in Zuni as opposed yeah. to with, with the Navajos. But one of the reviewers said that, you know, that the plot was okay. It was fine. But that that actually in the end wasn't a problem because the background that he, uh, that he builds it all in is so fascinating and engrossing that uh, even if it's only an okay plot playing out over that background, it's still a great read. Well, if Hillerman were around today, he would be nodding, saying yes, 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 because (laughs) when he sat down to write the first one, Blessing Way, which was going to be a warm-up novel, he thought, I'll just write a quick mystery and get that out of my way and then write the great American novel. He said several times that he didn't think he could come up with a good plot, but he knew how to write the backdrop. And that came from being a reporter, you know, providing the color in your stories. And um, he was very confident of that. And so that's when his writing was at his best. And yes, some of his plots fail, uh, and, and, but the readers don't care. But Dance Hall, Dance Hall of the Dead is a remarkable novel. It's the one I always recommend to people because um, I think it really represents the genius of his literary uh, high wire act. What he did in that book is that you see Zuni spirituality, culture, and history through the eyes of a Navajo. So you're getting both of them because the Navajo keeps saying, huh, that's funny, we don't do that, or huh, we do that too. And, um, and so you're, you're, you're looking through the eye, uh, an Anglo is writing a description through the eyes of a Navajo portraying yet another culture. And it works so well that I think it's been underappreciated as an act of, of literary genius, to my mind. I'm not, I don't want to elevate Hilleman to being an important literary figure, um, because he did write, as Graham Greene would call them, entertainments. But that doesn't mean we can't take the craft of it seriously. And in that case, he really succeeded. Well, how, does he, how did he do this craft then? How did he go about his, his research? I know specifically with Zuni and Dance Hall of the Dead, uh, the village elders called him in and kind of grilled him and said, they did. who spoke to you? Yeah. Who revealed to you? Uh, Cause he, he had talked about, and this is something he got in some trouble with at various times that maybe he, and this is definitely something that in the modern day now, as people cry uh, uh, or as, as people talk about cultural appropriation, mm-hmm. uh, not just with Hilleman, but with others is that, well, some things are not meant to be spoken about. And even if you, you find out about it, it's not proper to, to share it. And the Zunis were very concerned uh, about that and wanted to know who had 
revealed yeah. sacred things to the public. So, so how did he go about researching? And I know there's a in, in libraries and archives there's a component, but I'd also then like if you can kind of explain that to us. I'd also like to talk about the informants that he did have and, and yeah. the contacts and advisors he had. But Informa so with the, informants is an interesting. Yeah, community. sorry, that's that's kind of a loaded. Term. No, no, I, I think no, no, I don't <laughs> think so necessarily. But that, that's also maybe the term that the Zunis were thinking of, right? Yeah. Like. No, that's, that's why inside. it's that's why it's a very interesting term. Well, you, right away you can tell he did not use pueblos often, because the, one of the divide, divisions between the pueblo world and Navajo world is that the Navajos have sometimes been described as the Unitarians of this world. They're just glad to chat with you and share things. It's a slight exaggeration, but the Navajos have a strong streak of humor, so they wouldn't take objection to it. Pueblos tend to be much more serious, serious and much the Pueblo culture and much more guarded. And as you know, we all now know and understand that oppressed groups and um, of any sort in the world, when their resources have been taken from them, their land has been taken from them, whatever, one of the things of value that they can control and retain is their own culture, their own traditions, their own spiritual beliefs. And then the Zunis, like other Pueblos, were very concerned when some of these things began to appear in print. Because in a way, it's I mean, there's extractive industries, right? Yeah, mining, that is a like that is pulling things out of the landscape. Yeah. But, but there's also the extraction of culture, which there's a whole generation of anthropologists who, especially with the Pueblos, went yeah. to the Pueblos and extracted information and then published it for the world to see. At many times in ways that the Pueblos were uncomfortable with. So they got... And, and, and they got yeah. nothing out of it, too. Um, you know, they, they weren't financially rewarded for that, whereas the coal producers at least left a little cash behind. Uh, the anthropologists didn't, you know. Um, but, um, yeah, so so back to the... Starting with the Pueblos, that, that Hillerman made a conscious decision not to set his books in Pueblos, except for Dance Hall of Dead and... Uh, uh, I'm trying to remember the other one, T not Talking God, but um, uh, Mudhead. Oh, anyway, sorry, 18 books. I'm going to figure, figure out <laughs> forget which one goes with. But they're really only two or three, one also with the Hopis, and that was difficult. So he found a better home among the Navajos in terms of getting the kind of information he needed. But uh, let's start going back to the first one. Blessing Way was mostly book learned. Uh, he, he knew some Navajo students on the campus and asked them some questions, but he used the anthropological world works that we were we were just talking about, uh, their translations of ceremonies and chants and stuff, which Hillerman altered to get around copyright in in the in the blessing way. But he didn't undertake a serious approach to this until his third novel, the second Navajo novel, A Dance All the Dead. And that's when he began to do the kind of classic research you need to do, which was get in the, his Isuzu and head out to the Navajo Nation. And over the course of time, he met a number of people who were more than willing to share the world with him. Uh, Austin Sam took him to a Yebuche fest uh, ceremony overnight. And his notes are basically that two or three pages in the book. Where, where the protagonist sat is where Hillerman sat. Um, he made a number of friends where he could use his book learning to say, is this really the way it's done? And how do we do this? And can we walk out here? And as I said- So would he do line, some book research first? He would do yeah, research and then he'd go out and bounce it off I think he'd do, of... do it first and then back and second. And, uh, you know, writing fiction is even harder in planning than writing nonfiction in the sense that writing nonfiction, I'm researching until the last day because I don't know what it is, where the story is going to go. And that's based on facts. If you're a novelist, you have no idea what your characters are going to do. So um, sometimes you decide, I need a small town with a bunch of adobe ruins uh, on a windswept hill. And he and Marie would drive around to find it. And they'd find one person living there and they'd ask some questions and suddenly gold tooth would appear in the book. So book learning was used a lot. Um, but less and less so. Once he got his base done from the anthropological work and the anthropological professors that he talked to at UNM, from then on, I think his research was primarily talking, visiting, seeing. Um, and the germ of an idea would, would come from something he'd read, maybe. Um, one, of the, um, one of his books, uh, you know, he read about the murder of a police officer. It turned out to be an Apache, but he used it for his book. I mean, he'd get a little gem and then he'd put these ideas away. 
Um, and, you know, 18 books is a hard thing to pull off. And you can see as you read them that the quality goes up and down, and especially later in his life when I think it's a, a hard work to get those last few books done. And if you read them as closely as I had to read them, you start seeing the reappearances of sentences and scenes mm. that you know, I'll grab something. I mean, I don't think he was conscious saying I'll grab scene three from book four, but you know, the, the fingers type and suddenly you've got a very similar structure. In fact, some of his plot structures are stolen from the previous books. Mm -hmm. Tell us about a, a kind of a good experience of him doing research on the ground or just by being out there, this uh, tale of him, uh, as part of a rafting trip. Oh, yeah, um, down the San heading, Juan. Heading down the San Juan. To tell us this story. Yeah, it's a uh, it's an interesting tale. My wife and I took the same raft trip uh, to retrace it. Um, he had written Skinwalkers. Uh, let me just set up the stage for people. The first three books had Joe Leaporn. Joe Leaporn, not only was his name not Navajo, but he had a lot of limitations once his franchise got going, and he created Jim Chi. So the next three books had... Jim Chi is the protagonist, until a, a reader in a bookstore said to him, uh, why did you change the name of your protagonist? And Hillman said, I didn't. I created a new one. <laughs> new one. <laughs> so with Skinwalkers, he brought them both into the book. So you could see Lee Porn and Chi next to each other. That book was a, was a commercial success to the point that Harper, Colin, Harper then um, realized if they really spent some money, they might make have a breakthrough book. So Thief of Time, which is the next book, is the one he went on down the San Juan. That's the book that became the New York Times bestseller and launched his career that he wouldn't have to do anything but write from then on. He really needed a scene, uh, a particular kind of scene. He wasn't sure exactly what, but a friend of his whose last name was Murphy, Dan Murphy, uh, told him that there was a special spot along the San Juan River if you got out of your boat and climbed up. Uh, it's a set of ruins and that there was a, a little small spring and green things, and it would be the perfect setting for the, the scene that Hillman needed to do. Very often, and this is un, not necessarily untrue of nonfiction writers, but the first part of the book comes late in the book. We don't necessarily write books in order, and he knew he wanted this up front, and he'd thrown out his other scenes. So he took a, he, he took a raft trip down the river, and walked up to that spot and found what he needed. And, uh, and in a matter of time, um, uh, went back to Albuquerque and wrote up the scene. But to give you a, a sense of Hillerman's connection with the, what he saw out there is that he um, observed two, um, I guess it was sandhill cranes flying and reflected on how they mate for life. And if you see one alone, that means it's a widow or widower. And it was at that point he realized that a, a character had been hidden in the background, Joe Leapoint's wife, uh, would have to die. And so that's sort of the organic nature of his plot making, that, that being in the site um, would change things. And, you know, any of us can experience that. I mean, if you go to um, a Yebiche fest, uh, ceremony or, uh, or Yebichai, sorry, or a blessing way, one of the things you're going to remember are things like how bloody cold it was or how hard the seat was or, uh, or to an Anglo's ears, how at times monotonous the chants were. But if you listen carefully, they're not. That kind of thing. And that's why there's this kind of um, authenticity to his work because nothing that appears in his books really are things he had not seen. In fact, in fact where he did make a couple of mistakes is where he hadn't gone to a spot sometimes and, and stuck it in. And he moved to town at one point because he wanted the conversation to last longer. Needless to say, readers wrote him. Readers <laughs> love to point out mistakes. I mean, as you know, as an author, you, you're bound to get a letter that tells you on page 600 of your incredible book on such and such, um, you've misnamed the first settler. So Hillman would get letters like, don't you know that deers don't have gallbladders? or creosote bushes don't grow above a certain altitude. And Hilleman took it with a good sense of humor that, you know, how can you not make these mistakes? <laughs> um, yeah, how does he, as his career goes on, yeah, so as you say, um, after Skinwalkers, his publisher, real, and, and the previous books, many of them had, had done well. Yeah, very well. Uh, uh, they were selling, yeah, you know, a lot of copies, but after Skinwalkers and then A Thief of Time, He's able to uh, 
quit the job, quit his job at the University of New Mexico, he was, where mm -hmm. he was teaching, and just write full time. Yeah, well, almost write full time. One of the problems he became, he said, "I'm so busy being a writer that I don't have time to write." Speeches, signing books, giving people advice, blurbs for books is very time consuming. But yeah, yes. because up until then, he's not doing national tours, giving no. talks uh, no. and readings, and he's not having him like you know he got uh, your fan mail very early on when yeah. maybe he wasn't getting many, but later he can't respond to them all. No, he, um, he has to give up his phone number, all kinds. I mean, the normal things of fame. Imagine today, if it was today with the social media. I mean, at least he was spared that. Yeah. But as his career goes on, um, how does his, um, and, and, and also his relationship with Navajos, with the landscape, as now he's lived here for decades and decades, he's been writing about it. Uh, you note that sometimes the, the quality of the novels kind of kinds of goes up and mm -hmm. down. They do. But um, do you see a progression and a continual growth in his uh, kind of the, the authenticity of his? I don't want to use the word westernness because, but his his comfort level of being a westerner of writing about the southwest do you see that start to grow and be more confident uh more apparent more compelling in the later novels these are hard questions um or, or do you think that he, he kind of hit I, his stride early and no i i think the answer is he hit his stride early i think um i think in many ways his books were going back to the same well and providing to his devoted readers a yet another story. Um, but I think his, his that's one of the reasons why I think Dance Hall of the Dead is, is, is in many ways a greater achievement than The Thief of Time, which is the best-selling book of the series. Um, and that in some ways he's repeating himself. I don't, I, he certainly doesn't undergo the kind of personal growth that he underwent in the first uh, four or five books. Um, you can just tell that he's just amazed at what he's learning and he's reflecting on it and thinking about, you know, why, why hadn't we done with the returning Viet vets from Vietnam a kind of enemy way for them to help them get readjusted to society? We simply, they got off the plane in San Francisco and given a bus ticket home. Um, and, um, and I think as much as he loved attention and love telling tales he, he was sort of on auto autopilot for a long time after his success um he could go anywhere and tell the same i mean if, if you'd study him like i had to study him it's very much like following a politician who gives a speech in ohio gets on the plane and lands in illinois and with this deep sense of authenticity says something like Looking at the Illinois landscape reminds me of my childhood because I grew up in a small town in Oklahoma, you see, and those <laughs> stories. And one of the things that happens with Hillerman, which interestingly enough happened with Hemingway, who I'd written about in a previous book, is that I think people who deeply invest themselves in fiction, especially having been journalists before, lose that dividing line between reality and, and fiction in that Hillerman began to tell stories that, that, that weren't true or were, had a grain of truth, but were so elaborated in his public presentations that he'd come to believe the newer versions. I don't fault him for that because it's such a common trait for people who write fiction. There's this, they lose this distinction between what something really happened and something that was crea created in the world of literature. So I think Hillerman's growth took place between 66 and... 84. And then after that, um, he's still doing good work, mind you, but it's, it, it, he's back to the same, same place. Um, how does his writing, or how did his writing and his relationship with Navajos and these Western landscapes uh, lead to kind of his personal healing or mm. finding harmony? If that's what, if that's what was so profound to him, of the, with that early encounter with the, the Navajos and, you know, the enemy way ceremony. Um, how did he come to that himself? Like, you know, through his writing. If Hillerman was a novel, that would be the narrative thread of the novel. And I tried to make it the narrative thread of my nonfiction biography of him, that, that his 
I call it a kind of emotional compulsiveness or obsession with, with inhabiting the world that was not his about the Navajo pursuit for harmony. And I think that provided for him a salve because yes, um, PTSD didn't exist as a term in World War II, but the VA diagnosed him as having that. He admitted to his best friend he had that. Um, there were, uh, there's a, a war book published by Kent State University that he participates in that helps bring back a lot of memories. Um, but he he didn't want to talk about them. When he wrote his memoirs, the first time he really dealt with it, and the clue is that 33% of his memoir, a third of his memoir, is devoted to six months of war. Um, it tells you something about how important that moment was. So one of the reasons I think Hillerman continued to write these books, even though he had an ambition, he had commercial pressure to keep writing Navajo books, because every time he said to his agent and his publisher, I want to write a novel about such and such, they'd say, here, we'll give you $2 million to write two more Hill Navajo books. And if you really, really, really want to do it, we'll let you do the third book, which can be whatever you want to do. And so in some ways, he was frustrated by that because he thought of himself as a novelist and Finding Moon is the book that he tried to do that in, um, which is not a Navo book. But the reward of doing the Navo books was not the success of them, not the financial, but he would go to his study and immerse himself in a culture that provided a salve for him, that their pursuit of harmony when he wrote those scenes would, I mean, I'm, I'm, extrapolating and projecting onto him certain things. I don't know if he actually went through this, but I felt that his when he was writing these things, it provided him a kind of relief, a kind of safety, a kind of world that, that he felt comfortable in. And he, like many World War II veterans, you know, they didn't talk about the war. Max Evans, another famous Western writer who, who knew Tony, who died recently, um, he never told anything about being a gunner in World War II. Um, and so that made dealing with PTSD uh, or shell shock or war fatigue, whatever we wanted to call it back then, harder because it remained buried within them, which is why some of these men were very explosives. I mean, I, I interviewed the leading expert on PTSD who knew a lot about World War II veterans. And she says the commonality among these men is they became obsessive about work. They rose to the top of their corporations or they became famous writers or in Hillerman's case, that kind of thing. Um, and, and, and they buried their feelings in a way that sometimes it exploded in very unhealthy manners. And Hillerman's, Hillerman's relief valve was, was the Navajo world. Hmm. My wife's grandpa um, was in the Pacific and I think uh, was, you know, was on the beach at Iwo Jima or Okinawa, one of the big ones. And the family knew this. But it wasn't until just before his death that one of my wife's aunts got him to say something. Mm -hmm. And that's, he said uh, a little bit, and that's it. Even his wife just had, there, there was never that that sharing or that release. Um, so it, it, that world's changed so much. I mean, one of the things that when we celebrated uh, 50 years of D-Day and they interviewed these, you know, on t CBS Evening News, you know, these veterans hated the term heroes. Because they kept saying the heroes are the ones we left on the beach. We were the survivors. And think of the difference between the word surviving and hero. You think of heroes as well-adjusted people who, who are remarkable. Survivors usually have some, something that's with them, some damage, a lost leg or mental problem or uh, disease or something. And, and that's how they viewed themselves. And Hillerman was like that. Yeah. But we all have that. We all have, some, we all have something broken within mm -hmm. us. And, you know, Hillerman finds writing about Navajos in the Southwest as, as something that would heal him and help him uh, come to terms with, you know, with whatever, whatever inner demons, you know, he had. Um, I have a number of friends here uh, along the Wasatch Front um, who are former addicts and have turned to um, trail running and uh, ultra marathons, like running these mm -hmm. insane 100 mile, 200 mile races up in the mountains doing horrific things to their bodies, but specifically as a way to heal and yep. as a way to deal with, yeah, with, with their inner demons. Um, and they've found real power in Western mountains and landscapes and being, and they, and, you know, I, I'm, I'm kind of, I'm writing a book about this as well, about, you know, the, the power of kind of wild places and what it does to us as humans. But I've talked to some of them and they talk about it explicitly. They say, you know, they grew up and 
you know, Massachusetts or wherever, but the Western landscape, these remote, rugged Western places uh, do something to them. And among Western writers, Hillerman is an excellent example of the power of landscape. And that's part of the reason why towards the end of this book, the book, I have him revisit. I don't, I'm not a novelist. I can't say I had him revisit, but I recount a visit he had to Mount Taylor and watching the storms come in. And that was a moment of enormous happiness for him. And, you know, I think a commonality of the West is that um, I had a relative come and visit us 20 years ago and said, you know, it's awfully brown out here. And whereas we all see it as multiple browns, <laughs> uh, you know, you see the one wildflower after a rain that pops up as opposed to seeing the manicured lawns of New England with flower beds. And for some people, it's a repulsion. They say, oh, I couldn't live out here. And for others, it's, there's no middle ground. I mean, you're either for it or you're against it. And Hilleman worshipped the landscape, worshipped the Navajo world. And he saw himself as a reverse missionary, is a term he used. He wanted the world to know about what he had discovered. <sighs> There's a loaded term because it has existed for hundreds of years. What he found for himself in the Navajo world and represented in his fiction. Yeah, it makes me wonder if there, yeah, if there's something unique about the austerity or mm -hmm. um, the the not not the bleakness, but um, it's a it's a rough landscape out there. But I wonder if there's something about that that makes it particularly attractive or particularly healing or powerful or emotional for people who are struggling with you know. For people who are searching for certain things, I think it does indeed. He Hillman always told the story of. I won't have the exact name, but there's a valley that uh, is, that he said the map makers, and this is again where Hillman isn't always accurate, but he claimed the map makers called it something like Desolate Valley. Um, I couldn't find a map with that on, but I did find people calling it that. Um, and his Navajo friend called it, said, no, we call it Beautiful Valley. And it's it's very much what the eyes bring to it. And, and that's why the backstory of Hillman to me was so important for people to understand where this creativity came from and why it was shaped a particular way. Um, and and he, he was an outsider who deeply wanted to be on the inside of something and was able to do it by creating fiction. At that moment, he was inside. I mean, writing, writing about Zuni through Joe Leaporn's eyes, clearly he's sitting at the typewriter then before computers. Um, envisioning something through the eyes of somebody who from a different culture entirely than he is. I mean, I, I kind of wanted to wrap this up by asking, you know, what, what are the lessons from Hillerman's life that we should take? But I, maybe, maybe this is it to, you know, the eyes that you bring with you to, and what you're looking to find is, is what you'll find um, uh, often. And, and depending on what you bring with you, your experience in a place, be it, you know, the Southwest or elsewhere is going to be directed by that often. It's, it's not necessarily always what you bring, but it's the clairvoyance of your eyes and the sense of being open to understanding things that are different than yours, as opposed to reinterpreting them through your own thing. Um, you know, Hillerman's life, part of the reason I, I like the publication being at this time is I think his life is a, is a perfect source uh, or, or example to debate this idea of who can write whose stories. Um, because he is an outsider. He's not an Navajo. He's writing about things that are very central to their lives. He's not a purposeful appropriator. He's not like a major corporation coming in and seeing a design, altering it a little bit, putting it on a t-shirt and making millions of dollars. Uh, one of the hidden stories about Hillman is he gave back millions of dollars. And a lot of Navajos never Quietly. knew this. Quietly, right. because yeah. Sisters of Mercy and all of that upbringing was that you don't you don't herald your own charity. I mean, that's yeah. you do it out of obligation. Um, so, and Hillerman's life spans the coming of con growing consciousness of can one do this ethically and morally? And we would lose something if we throw it all out in the sense that, yes, there's authenticity in Richard Wright's work and Ralph Ellison's work. But there are books that have changed history that are often written by the outsider. Um, you know, Uncle Tom's Cabin was written by a white person uh, uh, to maybe the detriment of Native Americans. Laurel Ingalls Wilder's books were written by a, a white woman. Um, if, we, if we 
claim that the only authenticity we can have is it has to be written by the by the person or that culture. Does that presume then, for instance, I can't write a book about a woman, which I did, a biography of a woman? Um, uh, does that mean that I I can only be limited to writing books about entitled bald white males? You know, and I, I'm not trying to make fun of it, but the question is, where does it go to? And I think the issue has to be handled more broadly than that. And I think Hilleman offers a, a chance to chat about that because he's not a he's not an appropriate, not a purposeful appropriator. He didn't wake up one day and say, hey, I can make some money out of those Navajos. And so it's a really good example to use. The gray ones are always the good ones. The black and whites are easy to solve. And there are people who've come in and 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 done the modern equivalent of literary pillage and stolen things. And, and Hilleman actually did that um, uh, innocently, he published a very important tale of the Zuni uh, Pueblo, which if he'd done today, he would have been ostracized for it, and he would have recognized it later. But that was kind of that wonderful innocence he had that aw shucks from Oklahoma. Oh, you've got a really nice tale here. We ought to fix it up and let Anglos learn about it. Yeah. <laughs> well, he, I, I think you're right. In our current moment, he is a, it's a powerful example for us to sit with. And, and think about. Yeah. Um, well, I really appreciate you taking some time uh, to talk with us. And I, when I saw that there was there was this you know upcoming biography of Hillerman, and I said yes because I know I really knew nothing about the man except that I had read so many of the books. So I was, it was so eye opening and so great, and it makes me want to go back and maybe on road trips I'll start having my kids listen to these audio books as we drive around. Uh, the desert Southwest, maybe they'll fall in love with them like I did. But well, um, if, I, it, I, if you have time for a 30 second tale, it relates to that. I can add that. Please. On. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe okay. we can close with this. Yeah. Um, in 1990, an actor named George Budell uh, was called up by his agent and said that these things called recorded books, that everybody's going nuts over. And this company called recorded books wants you to try out to read, or I, I guess they called it perform the work by this Western writer named Tony Hillerman. Goodall got the job and ended up reading all 18 of the novels. So that's who I was listening to? Yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> and he has become the single most recorded voice in audiobooks. 1,700 books by this point in his life. And so I listened to Dostoevsky, to Victor Hugo, to Don Quixote. I listened to Don Quixote walking across Spain on the Camino de Santiago with George Goodell in my ears. There are people who buy audiobooks by the narrator rather than by the author. And George Goodell is one of those. Well, I had to interview him for this book. So I got to talk to him. The long and short of it is George Goodell recorded the audio version of my biography of Tony Hillerman. And in it, it's the only time in his life he has to read a passage about himself because he appears in the book. <laughs> That's great. And that may have been my greatest literary thrill because I started listening to audiobooks in January of 1979, and they've always been part of my life. So to have him read my book has been been really an amazing moment in my life. You've come full circle. That's yeah. great. Yeah. Well, Jamie, thank you so much for chatting. I really it appreciate it. It was a pleasure it. being with you, and good luck. Thank you. Yeah, and best of luck on you know whatever your next literary adventures are going to be. We'll look forward to it. Thanks. I really appreciate you giving me the time to talk at length about this. All right. Take care, Jamie. Bye-bye. Thank you so much for listening. I hope you'll subscribe and listen every month. Please leave us a review on whatever app or platform you're listening through, or follow us on Facebook at Writing Westward Podcast, or on Twitter at Writing West, where you can get updates and leave comments. Writing Westward is a production of the Charles Red Center for Western Studies at Brigham Young University. We're an interdisciplinary research center that supports academic research and the promotion of public understandings about the North American West. We host regular public lectures, which we live stream, have an annual funding cycle with award, grant, and fellowship categories that nearly anyone researching or working on the region from any disciplinary approach or towards any final product can apply. Learn more at redcenter.byu.edu. That's R-E-D-D -D Center. Our theme music was provided by local Utah composer Micah Dahl Anderson. Find him at Micah, D-A-H-L, Dahl, Anderson, with an O, dot com. I'll put a link in the episode description. My name is Brendan Rensink. I serve as the podcast host, producer, and just about everything else. So you can direct any praise or critique my way. 
I'm author and editor of a number of books on the West, borderlands, native peoples, genocide studies, religion, and the environment. Recently, my book, Native But Foreign, Indigenous Immigrants and Refugees in the North American Borderlands, published by Texas A&M University Press in 2018, won the Best Historical Nonfiction Book Award from the Western Writers of America. In an anthology I co-edited with P. Jane Hafen, entitled Essays on American Indian and Mormon History, published by the University of Utah Press in 2019, won the Metcalf Best Anthology Book Prize from the John Whitmer Historical Association. Here at the Red Center, I'm also general editor and project manager of a great digital history, uh, public history project named Intermountain Histories. It's a free mobile app and website, uh, intermountainhistories.org, that curates student-researched and written micro-histories of the region, complete with archival photos, bibliographies, and more. To contact me about the podcast, my own research, or anything else, head to bwrensink, that's R-E-N-S-I-N-K, Dot org, or follow me on Twitter at Brendan W. Rensink. Until next month, be well, be curious, and be kind. Cheers. <laughs>